and you are watching This Matters TV. I'm Tamika Hart, owner and creator of Body by Tamika and youth director of the Carol Mirage Foundation. And you are watching This Matters TV. Hi, I'm Carol Mirage from the Carol Mirage Foundation and this is This Matters TV. So now, let's give glory to God on the keyboards. Let's make a joyful noise on this piano. Our next performer is Hugh Vaughn Hutchinson Goodrich. Wake up the ivories, wake up the ivories. He woke up the ivories. You sound like you wanted more of that. You want him to do it again? Hugh Vaughn, would you please give us the honors of waking up the ivories?
Excellent, excellent. Our next. Excellent job. That was Caribbean Holiday. Yes, it was. <laughs> that was an improvisation, so understand how difficult that piece was and how well he did. Oh, 
Never. But we've learned in all of our experiences all the things we can do to make something happen. So with the center, that's not talk anymore. The center is your actions. No action, the center, nothing changes. So help the mayor and your center. Thank you. Phil Papa Alborale, a big hand clap. Appreciate that presentation. I'm Assemblyman Charles Brown. I want to talk about some larger issues around the whole NYCHA development. The reason why they treat us the way they do, because of the 400,000 to 500,000 NYCHA residents, 90% of them are black and Latino. And they think they can run a plantation. Those days are over. Those days are over. We want respect from NYCHA, they need new management. We've never got a NYCHA director that knew what they were doing. Because they have no respect for us, so they give us anybody. They gave us a guy from Wall Street, Raya, he didn't know what she was, he was doing. They gave us a director after director. None of them has an expertise in dealing with us. We need to determine who these new directors are. Let me deal with the question of privatization of NYCHA property privatization of NYCHA property. New York City and New York State is going out of the business of having anything that they build on their property. So they leave in property vacant and they're turning it over to private developers. Yep. So our position is that whoever they turn it over to is not going to bring gentrification or ethnic cleansing to our neighborhood. So whoever the developer is, they're going to develop affordable housing for our seniors. We support that. If there's NYCHA property that's available for our seniors to get some housing, we support that. You know that property in between Linden Houses and Boulevard? That property there was NYCHA's, and it was vacant, nothing. So they tried to tell us they wanted to bring some market rate housing going up 12 stories. And you know, when they say market rate, they want to bring in white people, whites. We said that's not going to happen. So on that night of property, we have a senior citizen housing built 100% us. The rest of the housing, 100% us and we even built a youth center a state-of-the-art youth center y'all gotta come by and see the prince joshua avito community center y'all gotta come see it you gotta come see it all of you gotta visit it it's right on stanley and and skank two stories high a state-of-the-art gymnasium we have classes for martial arts they're learning how to prepare resumes and for jobs. We have Man Up Inc. is in there, teaching them manhood training. We have a state-of-the-art center, culinary arts. We have a place where they can learn how to cook. We have computer labs, and we have a recording studio so they can record music. That needs to happen in every area in our neighborhood. We don't need more shelters, we don't need more jails, we need more youth centers. So when de Blasio, with his $90 billion budget, and Cuomo, with a $168 billion budget, you know how much money that is in one state? One state, that's over $258 billion in one state. Don't talk to me about no Donald Trump cutting this and that. You have enough money in this state to handle the business of the people of this state. You give up the money. Send the money to the hood. Send the money to our neighborhood. So we're going to fight them on that level. Don't let them come by taking pictures with you before election time, promising stuff. You don't see them after election. You don't see the money come in. They come during election time skinning and grinning and seeing how much they love you and how much they want to build in your community. Show us the money. Show us the money before election time and then we'll believe you. So we're going to fight them on that level. If they do come in with any property here and build anything here, it's going to be what you want built and where you want built for and who you want it built for or else it's not going to happen. 
or else it's not gonna happen. So we're gonna fight that. NYCHA, leave it up to me, I would give it to the Nation of Islam and say, let them, let them organize. <laughs> if we had the Nation of Islam doing the security, we wouldn't even have any crime. You know, they used to get some contracts, and we had the brothers from the Fruit of Islam, they came, crime was zero. They don't even have guns. Crime was zero. And then they cut the funding for them and they give us some of these other folk that ain't doing nothing for our neighborhood. So we should determine, we should determine who we want to be security for our neighborhood. They need to give up NYCHA. You don't like us? You don't want to deal with us? Then give us the money and let us run it ourselves. We will take care of ourselves with our taxpaying dollars. We will take care of the administration, the management, and everything. NYCHA is critical. And we got to stop that class thing in our community. Some brothers and sisters that are homeowners. I don't like them people in the projects. You know, we got to stop that. But for the grace of God, you would be right where everybody else is. So we got to stop that class thing. That's why sometimes when I go out, they say, well, how, how, how did you, what did you do in life? Where did you grow up? I don't even say in the housing developments. I grew up in the projects, the PJs. I grew up on the Lower East Side and Lillian Wall projects. When I was growing up, y'all know how it was. Man, we used to make mayonnaise sandwiches. Didn't even have enough meat to put on it. And then I used to get, I used to be ashamed. Then we had to get that welfare food. The, you remember them boxes with all the writing on it? I made it seem like I was going to the laundry. I put some clothes over the shopping cart so they couldn't see the writing on the boxes. Y'all remember sometimes, we didn't have no remote where you sit on the couch and push the thing. You gotta get up and turn the channel. And y'all remember that antenna with the aluminum fall over the antenna? I remember stations used to go off at night. They ain't stay on all night, the station went off. When I had sneakers, remember the sneakers? For us it was Con, Converse, and remember the, the uh, Pro Cats? Pro Cats and Converse, $3 and $7. And Skippies, if you had brand duck Skippies, you didn't even get a chance to play on the court. They didn't pick you. I don't care how good you were, they would say, look at your feet, you don't have no Converse, they're not picking you. And when my shoes, when my sneakers, if my mother bought me a $7 pair of Converse, if at the bottom, you know, nowadays the sneakers are a couple of hundred dollars, as soon as the ripples wear out on the bottom, they want another pair. I had to wear mine till they got a hole in the bottom, and then my mother put cardboard inside, cardboard inside the sneaker. I had to wear the cardboard out, and the only time I got a new pair of sneakers is when they start talking, you know, on the front, when it just flapped open, then I got a new pair. But you know, that's when we were tight. That's when we looked out after each other. That's when you can go down to your neighbor and get some sugar because you ran out. That's when, if you saw someone's son doing something, you can whoop them. And they won't even go tell their mama because they get another whooping. We gotta get back to those days where we love each other, where we unite with each other. And we gotta get back to the days where we demand that people in power, like the Blasio and the governor, respect us. Don't just come around election time because we are a strong voting block and you will not get our vote just because you're skinning and gritting and telling us promises that you're not gonna keep. We're gonna keep fighting for you because one thing that's good, this is the good thing about public housing, it's a lot of us in one place. There's a whole lot of us in one place. If just Brookline went downtown in mass, and on three, we decided to sneeze, we'd blow the walls down. Just Brookline. Can you imagine if Linden houses, Brownsville houses, if we all united, that is a powerful force. Whatever we did in numbers, and this is what we're trying to get at, in large numbers, we could shut this city down. We could shut this city down until they respect us and give us our fair share of taxpaying dollars 
that we put into the government. And if you don't want to give us our fair share, then don't take our taxes. Brookline, we love you. And we're going to unite. We're going to stay strong. Let nobody divide us. And these positions we have, they don't have no real power and resources anyway. So stop fighting over them. Let's join together and be that united, strong fist. Y'all say power to the people. Power to the people. Hello there, this is Carmen Cita Gutierrez. I'm the director of the Office of Immigrant Affairs at the Queens District Attorney's Office. We are here today at the Rockaway Caribbean Carnival in Bayswater Park. The weather is lovely, it's a beautiful day, you have lots of music, food, entertainment, information. We are here for the community. The district attorney's office is here for the community, and we help everyone regardless of immigration status. Stop by, come say hello. Good evening, everybody. My name is Ravon, and this is HCC here, Haitian Community Coalition. We are located on Church and 38. We do, right now we are doing HIV testing, and we're also promoting for PrEP. Um, you can come down to us on 30, Church and 38. We promote, we do housing, we help with, uh, if you need help with immigration, if you are a Haitian individual and you need help with the English language, we also provide help with that. And we also do outreach, we, pro um, we promote harm reduction, and we try to make sure that people in the community are protected. So if you need anything, any help with housing, any help with uh, your health, come down to Church in 38. We're right between 38th and 39th, and we'll help you as much as we can. Right now we're over here, we're doing testing, so come right here, over here, we're doing testing. Uh, and we're also giving out bags. So come and it's important to know your status. Come in, know your status, and it'll only take about 10 minutes and enjoy your carnival. <laughs> Hi, my name is Tawana and I'm the Public Relations Chair of Female, Females of Culture United for Success. And this is our, at Adelphi University, and this is our annual AIDS Awareness Dinner where we raise awareness for AIDS and the progression of the disease over the past 30 years. We've come a long way. So we're here to just commemorate those who've passed on, celebrate, the, how far we've come in research in terms of prevention and medication, and we're just here to celebrate that and commemorate that. Hi everyone, my name is James. I'm here to support uh, this effort to raise awareness for AIDS and HIV. It's uh, this dinner at Adelphi University in Long Island, and um, I'm looking forward to a great program. Should be some informative speeches being given tonight. Um, and also we're gonna have some great food, I think, courtesy of the school. So I'm looking forward to that. It should start in a couple minutes. And uh, yeah, check out the highlights from this dinner uh, now. Hi, hello, my name is Jason Spradley. Um, we are here at the AKA's uh, World's AIDS Day celebration. This is actually um, for the day, the 30th anniversary. Uh, yesterday was for World AIDS Day. And I'm just happy to see that uh, the organization is carrying on the tradition of advocating for the eradication of HIV and AIDS. Um, and I'm sure it'll be a great night. So thank you all uh, very much for looking in and for everyone for coming. Thank you. Hi everyone, sorry for the delay. So good evening ladies and gentlemen. My name is Melissa Campbell and I'm the president of the Captivating Kappa Epsilon chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and the Vice President of Females of Culture United for Success, also known as FOCUS. I wanted to welcome everyone to the 2018 Annual AIDS Awareness Dinner. So I know you're probably gonna hear this a million times tonight, but it's only because I truly mean it. I really appreciate every one of you for coming out tonight. It means a lot to me that everyone made the time and effort to show up and become more educated on this important cause. Did you know that more than one million Americans are living with HIV, but one in five of them are not aware they are infected? The designated date for AIDS Awareness Day was actually yesterday, December 1st, and every year since 1988, people around the world use this day to raise awareness. This is the time where there is an international focus dedicated to raising awareness about the AIDS pandemic caused by the spread of HIV infection while remembering those who have passed on and celebrating victories such as increased access to treatment and prevention services. 
For example, the World Health Organization typically highlights the need for all 36.7 million Americans living with HIV affected by the epidemic or vulnerable to reach the goal or vulnerable to reach the goal of universal health coverage. So once again, thank you for understanding the importance of being here tonight. As you can see from the program in front of you, the night will start with a tribute in the form of a video on HIV throughout the years. And then there will be a reading of AIDS, a scary disease. We will eat, play some games, there will be a performance, and then we will have our keynote speaker, Jason Spradley. So thank you all for coming tonight. And now we will have Tawana Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you all for coming once again. My name is Tawana Mahoney, and I'm the Public Relations Chair of Female of Culture United for Success, otherwise known as FOCUS. Right now, we're going to watch a short video entitled HIV Timeline 30 Years. This video displays the progression of our knowledge and awareness of this disease over the span of 30 years. It is a vivid reminder of why we do the work that we do and the importance of continuous recognition and research of this disease. So I hope this video is very insightful, and once again, thank you for coming. We released the results of a study which shows that the lifestyle of some male homosexuals has triggered an epidemic. Which initially started in gay community, but now we see it spreading to heterosexual of men and women. So it's not really a, a gay related disease. It is an infectious agent, it's not it's spreading through the community. Researchers at the National Cancer Institute were able to isolate that virus and mass produce it for closer study. Health Secretary Margaret Hackler made the announcement to a jam news conference. The probable cause of AIDS has been found. Hudson died in his sleep at 9 this morning. His $3 million home in Beverly Hills. His publicist, Bill Olson. I simply did not expect him to terminate so suddenly.
one of the 60 million people affected. Acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, AIDS is what it's called. When you hear its name, you should be appalled. It has caused over 25 million deaths. Poor people who have taken their last breaths. It can be passed on by blood, semen, and even something as beautiful as birth. You don't want to be one of those people on earth. I know how to keep myself protected. I won't be like one of those people affected. A lot of people don't think that they are, and then they're left with like a permanent scar. So just remember the facts that I've told you, because everything I'm saying is true. Just be smart and keep your blood healthy and pumping through that heart. by Amani and Akua.
there's a voice that cries out in the silence, searching for a heart that will love him, longing for a child that will give him their all, give it all, he wants it all. And there's a God that walks over the earth, he's searching for a heart that is desperate, Longing for a child that will give a marrow, give it all, he wants it all. And he says, love me, love me with your whole heart, he wants it all today. Serve me, serve me with your life now, he wants it all today. Bow down. Let go of your idols. He wants it all today. He wants it all today. He wants it all today. So give it all. And there's a God that walks over the earth. He's searching for a heart that is desperate. Longing for a child that will give a marrow. Give it all. He wants it all.
laying yourself down, raising up the broken to life. Hello, um, my name is Imani Pickering and I am the Secretary of Females of Culture United for Success and now I'm just going to introduce our keynote speaker for the night, Jason Spradley, who helped Melissa tremendously put this all together and um, although he's not with Adelphi anymore, he continues to come out and support everything that we do, so we really appreciate him. Um, Jason Spradley pre previously served as an ass assistant director in the Center for Student Involvement at Adelphi University. While at Adelphi, he oversaw multicultural affairs, programming, and civic engagement. Currently, Jason works at the New York City Department of Education for the Chancellor's Advancing Equity Initiative. Jason earned his bachelor's degree from Texas State University and his master's from Hofstra University in rhetoric and performance studies with a focus on race and gender. He is passionate about intercultural and equity work for the liberation of all unrepresented and marginalized groups, but focuses his personal work largely around LGBTQ folks of color. So, Jason Spradley. Hello, everyone. I had to see me get up and sit down. And you're like, why is this random person in this turtleneck doing all this? <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm very excited to be here today. Um, one, I'm proud of my mentee, uh, Melissa. Um, just seeing her passion behind this event is really inspiring for me. And the other thing is, is just seeing that people uh, still care about um, understanding HIV and AIDS. Um, and it's currently being stigmatized as we move forward. Um, I'm going to be very brief as I talk today, um, but I'm just, I'm just again encouraged by everyone just being here. Um, so I picked the topic today of uh, demystifying HIV, um, and I feel like focused on that is because there still is a lot that people do not know around HIV and AIDS, around how people think that you can catch HIV um, from saliva or uh, certain sexual practices. And so I wanted to unpack that um, somewhat through my narrative and then also uh, talking about uh, prevention mechanisms. Is that okay with everybody? Awesome, grand jour. Um, so that's me, little Jason. Um, and I kind of remember um, loosely the first time I ever heard about HIV. I was young, not sure which age, but I was the young that people are when they are still playing uh, with Steve Urkel dolls. Yes, I had a Steve Urkel doll, <laughs> yes. Uh, and train sets and playing tag in the house before my mama whooped me. Um, it was a special day. I can't remember which day, um, what was going on, but family members I had not even seen uh, in my life showed up at our house for a celebration. Uh, of life or death. I can't remember if it was a birthday or a funeral. But people kept pulling up in our yard. And one of the last people to pull up was a cousin that, again, I had never seen before, older, around my mom's age, and people greeted him like all other people got greeted in our house. I'm black from the South, and I live in the rural South, so it was pleasantries, it was like sweet tea. Until he walked away, and when he walked away, um, and went far in the kitchen, I remember family members saying, he's got that stuff. Never fully saying what that stuff was or how he got it, but I just knew that I never wanted that stuff and I was weary of him, weary of being around him. And I was told to be careful and stay away from him. Around the same time, in the same age, at the same conversation, I heard about HIV again. This time it was paired with the word gay. It was a conversation that centered around another family member. I can't remember who it was, if it was an uncle, a cousin. And it was noting that they were probably gay and that they would probably had or that they would get or would catch that stuff. That stuff. My life has been plagued by that stuff. Focusing on if I would get, if I could catch uh, that stuff. Before I even knew or realized uh, that I was gay. 
um, my whole life centered around uh, demystifying, understanding, and making sure that I didn't become someone that would be stigmatized in a certain way. Um, when I got to high school and kind of realized myself in a different manner of who I would be and who I would become, um, I was brought back to the conversation of that stuff around black men and men that are gay are automatically going to get HIV or AIDS. And I made sure in my mind that I would not get it. Um, even though I, I felt that I was gay, I was attracted to men, I was like, I am not going to sleep with anyone because I don't want to get that stuff. Um, and I didn't want to disappoint my mother. Uh, my mother had poured a lot into me. She made sure I received the best of everything. I come from a focused family around education and success. So when I was younger and growing up in the summers, they would send me to political camps. Uh, I would meet with my congressman in the summer and shadow pages. Uh, so she would make sure that I was a fully and well-rounded, developed human being. And I just knew that I didn't want to disappoint my mother with being gay and potentially getting that stuff. Uh, when I told my mother, uh, loosely, I never really had to tell my mother that I was gay for I don't leave that for a conversation for another day. Um, she caught, saw something on my computer when I was younger. Um, <laughs> but when I was in my early 20s, um, a lot of gay men around my age, they were dying um, from a, a, a lot of different causes. Um, and it was this one group of gay black men uh, that died in a car accident. And something happened that when they died and their family members came to their funeral, uh, they didn't know that they were gay. Um, and so they, their family found out at that time. Um, and I just said I didn't want to do that to my family. Like if I were to die for whatever reason, I did not want my family to find out uh, who I was and how I lived um, at my funeral. And I, I didn't want to disrespect them for me in that way. So I called my mom, and I just broken up with my boyfriend of six years, who also used to live with me. Um, and I said, oh, I just I broke up with Sean, um, because I just moved from the assumption that she already knew I was gay from what she saw when I was 12 years old uh, on my computer. Um, and she said, OK, so OK, you're really gay, Jason. She said, can you get a job? <laughs> okay. And by that time I had a job, I had already finished undergrad, I had already moved to New York City. Um, she was just like, can you get like a real job? And I was like, I have a real job. <laughs> but she wanted me to be a politician. And I was like, yes, mom, you could be gay and you could be a politician. Um, and then she was centered around uh, the family. She was like, what am I going to tell um, my, your grandmother? Like, what am I going to center on that? Um, and that was, that was an interesting conversation, um, because from that conversation, my mom started exposing tons of things about herself um, around her views of love, identity, um, success, uh, why, why she didn't do certain things when she was younger, because of the family that we come from, around those pressures and certain stigmatizations of what it means to be a black woman, single mother, growing up in the South from a well-to-do black family, all those things that meant certain aspects. And we both suffered from the fear of disappointing those around us and not living our lives. And when I got older and I realized myself fully living in New York City, uh, coming from uh, around the Houston area, and I saw the possibility of who I could be, I had never seen the possibility that me, a gay black boy, could live a fully realized life until I got to New York City and saw people that identify the same way that I do uh, thrive. And it was miraculous for me. There was no shame attached to it. There was no shame around who I could be or what I was or what I could get. There was no large conversation around that stuff in a stigmatized way. And that was powerful for me. But I still kept with me the fear of getting that stuff. Uh, I feared that no one was going to love me if I got HIV. And then I became around people that actually had HIV. Um, and they didn't make it a huge part of who they were. Um, it was just something that was a part of them, but it didn't define them in a reality. And one of those people uh, that I was around um, was like very close to me. And it was just seeing like the possibility that someone can have a full life. And I became around more people. Um, and some of my friends who I'll actually play a video of are Timothy and Hari. Um, who kind of unpacked my whole notion of that no one would, would love me if I, if I had HIV. Um, and so I'll just play a clip from.
This is Anthony Mason Jr., founder of the Family on 3 Foundation. We're here with Real Fans Real Talk on This Matters TV. You should pay attention to what's going on with the Family on 3 Foundation. We're a youth enrichment program and like the big brother, big sister of the community. So log in on www.familyon3.org or catch us on IG, Family on 3 spelled out. Shout out to This Matters TV, Real Fans Real Talk, all family. What's up? The carpet again is always turned up. It's always great to see amazing people. I just caught up with Yashi, Miss Yashi, and she is a spoken word artist. Spoken word artist. She is family with a very great DNA. How are you? I'm wonderful. Nice to have you here. Nice to you. You live in New York? I live in New York. Um, I'm adjusting to the cold. <laughs> Why? <laughs> it's really, I'm an LA girl, I'm a Cali girl. It is what it is. <laughs> how do you manage it? Um, how am I managing it? I'm just taking it day by day. I stay in a lot, but um, I also go back to California. So I'm going to be on both coasts, and that's probably what it's going to be like. I need my warm weather. What inspired your writing for your spoken word? I mean, what inspires the, the, the portrait? I guess what you can say is I really started to take my spoken word seriously when I started to incur a lot of challenges with mental illness and the piece that I'm going to perform kind of brings that all together and talks a little bit and touches on the topics of uh, just mental health in general. So mental health for you, why, why, why that topic for you? That's okay. So when I was uh, 19 I started experiencing severe depression and then when I was 24 I was officially diagnosed with severe bipolar type 1 disorder. And even kind of, uh, they had thought at the beginning I was schizoaffective, I had severe psychosis, a lot of severe symptoms um, that you would never believe. And uh, so during those times, poetry, writing, and that was the outlet. That was what made me feel good. How do you feel now? I feel amazing. I feel, I mean, I am so blessed to be able to stand here. I am blessed because I was able to find the right treatment, the right support system, and of course my mom, my family, she was my rock. And through all of that positivity, I was able to get on the road of recovery and be here and now utilize my art, speak publicly, and tell people that it is okay to talk about it and recovery is real. Listen to me, it doesn't have a face, it doesn't have a color, it doesn't have a gender. It's not discriminate. It's not discriminate. Oh my God, I'm so proud of you, girl. What do you even know? I mean, it's awesome to see you know young ladies like yourself who are fighting for amazing cause. Who's not afraid? Who's not ashamed? Because there's a lot of people out there, a lot of kids, especially the young teenagers, young people who look at it as a this a disease. You know, they commit suicide. They they can't deal with the, the crisis. So when somebody like yourself can really rise up and say, listen, I'm going to face my problem. I'm going to make an example. I'm going to use my tool and my sickness and my sadness and spread this and make people understand we can live and we can survive. That's awesome. Congrats. I mean, it was very challenging. A lot of people say you're so brave. You have so much courage. But I know I needed to hear the words that I'm saying now. And I know there's somebody out there that is like me. I love you. It makes it easy knowing that. I love you. And I hope to God and I pray for you. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah.